Hello, it's Tom here. We've got a great episode for you today with GB News's Patrick Christie's. But before we get into that, I just want to let you all know how you can support Last Orders. As I mentioned last time, we've now gone bi-weekly due to overwhelming popular demand. You can now get me and Chris and guests in your ears twice a month. So please support us in this new venture by subscribing, giving us a glowing five-star review on your podcast app and telling all of your friends and family and acquaintances and people you bump into on the street about what a brilliant show this is, all of which takes just a few minutes. Also, thanks so much for all of your postbag questions. Please do keep those coming. You can email them into us at lastorders at spiked-online.com and we'll try to get through as many of your questions as we can in the next episode. Anyway, that's enough pre-show plugging from me. So let's go on with the show. Welcome to Last Orders, the Spike podcast all about freedom and the nanny state. In this episode, we discuss Labour's plan to ban cigarettes, Prince Harry's war on press freedom, and whether or not monkeypox is racist. Hello and welcome to Last Orders. I'm Tom Slater, editor of Spiked. Delighted to be joined on the show this week by Patrick Christie hey. from GB News. Patrick, yes, hello. On the show. And uh, joined as we are on every episode by Chris Snowden from the Institute of Economic Affairs. How are you doing, Chris? Well, Enjoying your January? Yeah, well, I was doing dry January. I was attending to do it. Me and my wife attended to it for, for a fortnight. But it's quite out both. of character. There, so. Well, I thought I'd give it a go. Mm. You know, I've heard a lot about it. I really recommend people don't do it. I think it's honestly, it's not natural. It's not after nine days. <laughs> after nine days, we both said, "Well, this is ridiculous." And I went mm. to Majestics and stocked up. And I, it was one of the low points of my whole life. I just, how do people who don't drink sleep? Mm. Do you know what I mean? How mm. does he tell us go to sleep at night? I, I had to start taking various types of downers and things like that. Mm. And so it's a slippery slope to much harder. Oh yeah, stuff. it's much worse for you. It's yeah. probably worse for your, for your liver. So I was getting addicted to them. I thought, "Well, this is just." So, you know, making things worse. So, um, so I've stopped. I don't know. I'm on the third day of recovery now, drinking mm, yeah. again, but I still feel rough. I feel 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 tired. Have the shakes it, stopped? <laughs> I wasn't shaking. Right. That's the funny thing. I know what you're, you're implying. Well, there. No, no, because that well, is, I just can, felt very because that is usually a sign that you could have gone harder before. I think if you don't get the shakes, yeah. It's a little, it's a little barometer for. Mm. You. So you think I should double down now? I think you're only the sensible thing to do now. Drink is twice to, as much is to drink twice as yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah, all right, all right. That's good advice. That's the kind of sensible advice you don't get from mm. the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities. Mm. <laughs> it's called. What you need to do is really lean into it in January, just to make sure that you don't. Um, I just think people shouldn't. Yeah, you know, it's a dreadful month for it as well. Have you ever it? tried it? No, no. Very sensible. Have you ever tried it, Patrick? I'm in AA, so I don't Are drink you? at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you found the right podcast, my friend. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see. Right? It's, uh, it's dry life for me, my man. <laughs> it's dry January, February, yeah, March. Yeah, yeah, dry, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but no, I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I feel for you because you now have at least the option to keep drinking. I have uh, court ordered bannock. <laughs> Uh, I feel in that case I should retract what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm encouraging everyone to, to, to drink and, and never give up. Well, let's, let's talk about something else that we, we're also quite happy encouraging people to do, which is uh, smoking. This is mm, the UK's yes. premier pro-smoking podcast. Um, yep. Pro-freedom, we say, but Sponsored really that's not what we mean. <laughs> <laughs> but, Chris, we talked a bit on the last episode about um, Yacinda Ardern's plan to go smoke-free, for New Zealand to go smoke-free, and now Labour's West Streeting in a couple of interviews has said that he's minded to follow her down that particular path. What do you think about all of this? You wrote about it. Not, not happy, three. Tom. Not really? <laughs> non, nonplussed. What did we say about it last time? I can't remember what we said about it. Did I just explain basically what they're trying to do? Essentially. Do you want to, do you want to re-air some of re, that? I'll rehash it because yeah. there's some bits I probably didn't mention last time because everyone focuses on the, the idea of raising the smoking age every year mm. um, by a year forever until nobody's old enough to buy a cigarette. And I think probably in New Zealand, smokers go, well, it doesn't matter because I'm already 18, so I'll always be able to buy yeah. cigarettes. But they're also doing two other things, which are even, in a way, even more batty. One is they're taking the nicotine out of cigarettes and apparently cigars as well, I heard. And they are reducing the number of shops that are allowed to sell tobacco from 6,000 to 600. 
been quite a step change. Mm. Mm. And they're doing some sort of, I think, kind of a lottery system to find out who gets like the golden ticket to make a huge amount of money selling tobacco. And there's a lot of fears about ram raiding of, of these shops, which already goes on quite in quite a big way in New Zealand. Um, so what the, I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, I don't even know if the tobacco industry is going to bother making cigarettes that don't have yeah, nicotine in yeah. them. You know what I mean? I mean, they might what as well just pull point? out. So essentially the prohibition really is is, is taking the nicotine out of cigarettes. Yeah. You know, if you, if you just... If you said, so well, just the, the only tar. beer people can buy is like Beck's Blue. Yeah. Well, that, you, people go, well, that's prohibition. Yeah. Come on, don't pretend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's prohibition. So the year, the you know, the age of purchase thing is, is pretty much by the by. Anyway, Wes Streeting um, popped up on, well, in, in the Times initially, and then he popped up on TV mm. saying he likes the sound of this. And this would be, you know, the first of many politicians around the world saying they like the sound of just in this idea. He said, yeah, like, I, he said to the Times, he said, I used to hell, hate the smell of tobacco yeah. growing up. Okay, uh-huh. well, so what? Yeah. So, <laughs> so you can ban it, can you? And he wants to have a clamp down on e-cigarettes because he doesn't like seeing youngsters outside vape shops. It's like the closest to a victimless crime you're ever really going to get. He's very, know? yeah, he's a very, very easy to annoy this fellow. Yeah. And well, totalitarian, like a lot of lefties. Yeah, anything that irritates him, he, he wants to ban. So he wants to ban smoking and he thinks that the, um, the Kiwi way of doing it is the way forward. And he said he's going to have a public consultation on it. And I wrote the thing for Spite, um, which, you know, people can obviously go out and read, but I basically said, this is a, well, this is the way this is going to go. Yeah. The consultation will be flooded with anti-smoking people. And if the government decides, the Labour government, as is, as will be, uh, they say, actually, we decided this is a bad idea. There's a lot of ram raiding going on in New Zealand yeah. and so on. Then um, the anti-smoking groups will say, this is a U-turn and the Labour Party are in the pocket, tobacco, blah, 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 blah. And it'll happen. I think it'll happen yeah. probably sooner than people think. But isn't it amazing, though, that a lot of the people who want to ban cigarettes because fully grown adults can make a conscious decision to smoke them anyway also want to do things like legalise drugs? Now, I'm not particularly saying that legalising drugs is an awful idea. I'm not particularly for it. I don't really lose a lot of sleep thinking about it, to be honest with you. But the idea that you would now ban cigarettes and at the yeah. same time go, well, okay, that cigarette shop is now a dispensary for crack or something. Mm-hmm. And also as well, I did see a, a tweet over the weekend and it was apparently a cigarette company. This is back in like the 50s when people dared to say, actually, maybe smoking is bad for your lungs. And to protect your lungs, they put asbestos in the filters. Jeez, and I just yeah, thought, yeah. we used to be a proper country, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we well, used to be like a proper up. country, and yeah. now look at us. The age thing is ridiculous. I remember when they put smoking age up to 18, which was particularly annoying because I'd only just turned 16, I think. Yeah. But um, also, at, at the same time, you get clamour to like, lower the voting age. So it's like you yeah, should be able yeah, to vote, right. but you're not allowed to smoke and all this stuff doesn't make a lot of sense. But it does feel like we're sort of on, lost the battle on this one, I hate to say it, because it does feel like it's been so thoroughly demonised smoking. It's the thing that the wrong kind of people do who, you know, it's the thing that, you know, you just have politicians, as you say, Chris, just like invoke their own visceral disgust of it. And that's pretty much enough of an argument. Huh? And despite the fact the smoking rate's gone down so much, it's still fair yeah, well, going. They got know. to a point, see, for years, there would always be an excuse for bringing these laws in. They were always pretty disingenuous, but usually about, about the children, generally speaking. Smoking ban obviously was about, well, poor bar stuff after breathing tobacco smoke. Most of it was, we don't want children mm. looking at tobacco adverts. We yeah. don't want children seeing tobacco in shops. We don't want children seeing colourful cigarette packs. Once they'd done all that stuff, there was nowhere left to go. Mm. You had to just basically say, we don't like smoking, we're going to ban it. And so when Theresa May tried to create a legacy for herself that didn't involve botching Brexit. She <laughs> she said, we're going to be smoke-free by 2030. Yeah. That was her thing. And so now all the public health groups have to say is the government's way behind on its target of going smoke-free yeah, by 2030. Exactly. There's no rationale for it. There's no sort yeah. of ethical reason going like, well, we've decided now that adults don't have the right to smoke. They just say, mm. there's a target mm-hmm. for it by one of the least popular prime ministers of the century. And um, so we've got to at this point. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'm just worried it'll be the gateway drug for banning loads of other stuff as well. We've We'll just come out the other side of something incredibly totalitarian and controlling, i.e. all of the restrictions that we've had before. We seem to be controlled subtly now in every single different aspect of our lives, no matter what it is that we do. The cost of living is putting the squeeze on a lot of people. That indirectly affects what a lot of people can do. And how long is it? Genuinely, we are now, because this show, apart from being sponsored by Benson and Hedges, and thank you very much <laughs> to Benson and Hedges, it's also sponsored by Ferrero Roche. And what there's are, a lovely spread oh, of Ferrero There's Russia, a lovely spread say. of Ferrero Rocher. How long is it before they are put, instead of that lovely gold wrapping, which of course is like, it, it, it is it's basically like a magnet for kits. Right? <laughs> How long is it before that turns into just plain black wrapping? How long is it before only people over the age of 50 are allowed to buy them? These evil gold disco balls, which are enchanting the youth. Yeah. 
you know. But, but people but, don't take the warnings like that seriously, and you're slightly over-egging it, obviously, mm. but not by that much, right? These people <laughs> these people do... Yeah. What? We'll be doing this in, like, like 20 years' time. It'll just be, like, bran flakes on the table. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, you know, nobody took people seriously, even a few years ago when they said, these anti-smoking people, uh, yeah. they are prohibitionists. They want to ban smoking. And the anti-smoking people will be on the radio from dawn to dusk going like, of course no one, no one's talking about banning smoking. Yeah. This is just hysterical, <laughs> libertarian claptrap, <laughs> hyperbole, trying to scare people off from a perfectly sensible public health reform. Mm. Well, they were, they were, it's proven now they're yeah. prohibitionists. None of these groups are going out actually saying, you know, oh, Jacinda's gone too far there, we disapprove of this. We've always said people have the right to smoke and we should yeah. defend that. Of course they're not. Nor is West Street or any of these other people. It was always a plan. They lied to us all all yeah. the way along. And now, how, why why should we trust the anti booze people and the anti sugar yeah. people and the yeah. anti gambling people when they go? Well, of course we respect people's right to gamble. We just want to get rid of these machines yeah. and bookmakers, and we want to get rid of the advertising, which is exactly what they're doing. And eventually, if they get Mental. I'm not saying this is a prediction, but I'm yeah. saying if they keep winning, they will do exactly the same thing as what the anti-smoking people did once they battered everyone down yeah. for decades mm-hmm. and go, I think it's time to probably just ban gambling now and be done with it. Let's yeah. have a target. <laughs> 20, 2050 gambling-free Britain. <laughs> well, well, no, but you, that actually will probably happen in the end. So there'll be some resistance to it, but that's the avenue that they're going yeah. for it as well. And also, one of the greatest ironies as well when it comes to things like you know, the stigmatisation of, 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 of booze and drinkers is it actually forces it underground. So people end up in their own homes with no chucking out time, mm. no one there to say, you're absolutely off your nut, mate, maybe you should go out. I mean, they drink more and then people develop a problem. Mm. Front on with that. No, and it's it's so miserable as well. And it feels like if you make any of these sort of arguments just on the basis of adults should be able to make their own decisions. Yeah. Or some people don't prioritise living as long, every eking out every week and minute as long as possible. Sometimes people prioritise having a good time, a bit of excess, a bit of pleasure. Like these... Arguments just fall completely. No, because it's flat you've got to now. prioritize a target set by Theresa May, mm. the fag yeah. end of her premiership for no reason. That's the real. <laughs> that's the real thing we should be working towards. Also elevated someone, to constitutional it importance. Wasn't even in the Tory manifesto. <laughs> so someone, someone as soulless as Theresa May as well. Yeah. Jumping down about, but of course she's the fun police. Obviously, look at her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what a legacy! But um, we should we should also talk about the other big story of the week, um, which the smoking thing is obviously unfortunately eclipsed, which is. Harry and Meghan, or Harry, I should say, because he's brought out his blockbuster memoir, Spare, yeah. in which he has let fly a bunch of salacious to quite hilarious anecdotes from his own youth and growing up, everything from the, the frostbitten penis to <laughs> the moaning about briefly being told to shave his beard um, through to all the usual kind of allegations that have been aired out in terms of the press hounded himself and Meghan Markle out of the UK, that the palace were briefing against him yeah. and so on and so forth. Patrick, obviously you'll have been covering this a lot this week, I'm sure. Yeah. What do you make of all of this? I mean, particularly also, because this is a sort of libertarian podcast, I mean, yeah. the press stuff, let's take that for a moment. You're in the media, you're in the Meghan bashing evil section of the media. Oh, I am, yeah, yeah. I think you've got background in the tabloids as well. Yeah, I, absolutely. In fact, I don't like to go on about it or anything, but I was actually in the uh, Harry and Meghan Netflix documentary, oh, yeah. Wow. I don't like it when people bring it up. I like to <laughs> you get on, on the it. About it. And uh, it. Please stop, stop, what, what stop. Were you, what were you doing in there? Oh, God, I'm glad you asked, Chris. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, I was in it, I was delivering one of my deathless monologues and I was saying that all she wanted was, or that, all she wanted <laughs> was, uh, you know, she thought it was going to be tea parties and tiaras mm. and all this. Anyway, they clipped that, but it was shortly after they've got this guy who no one's ever, no one's ever heard of this geezer, right? Sitting there talking about the gutter press. <laughs> so he does this big thing about what the gutter press is, how what journalism is devoid of any facts mm. or meaning. Cuts to... This little northern monkey. Oh, she thought. Tiara's in tea parties. And I was like, oh, I woke up, my phone was going off. I was like, you're in the documentary. I was like, well, this isn't going to be good. I didn't realise didn't realise my entire reputation would be left in tatters by whinge and ginge. The, but the, yeah. little, the literal personification of the gutter press. The, the, the literal, yeah. The representative <laughs> of the gutter press. Going, bear in mind. Can you please account for yourself. Yeah, in bear, this but form. bear in mind, obviously, Harry's relationship with the press going back all of these years, the fact that they chose to use me as the example <laughs> really made a good line how much tea parties are. and tiaras yeah exactly but now I, I I just think you know it's gone beyond the point for him of 
yeah, or maybe there was briefings against him and Megan and all of this stuff. But actually, people can see things in the round now. Yeah. They've got the Netflix documentary. They've got his book. They just know them relatively well now. There's a series of different documentaries, Oprah. If people think they're tossers, and they think they're tossers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it does feel like people are starting to back away from the crime scene a little bit. Like, even those sort of liberal left journalists who would do a bunch of throat clearing about not caring about the monarchy, but then would be like, it's dreadful how the press has treated this lovely young diverse couple and so on. So they're in England, less so in America where he's still getting kind of whooping receptions from late night show audiences. Yeah. There's this kind of, Oh, we did back a couple of chances a little bit. They won't fully admit to it, but because you get all of the details, you get all the whinging about my room was the small room and I had to shave (laughs) my my cottage was too small. My cottage was too small. My, my footman was completely underqualified. Yeah, like, this sort of thing. I love the fact that Camilla turned his room into a wardrobe as soon as he's moved out as well. Have that, Harry. See you in a bit, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Like, keep my fur coat I've, <laughs> I've nicked your dad. I've nicked your room. Have a bit of that. But um, yeah, but it's, there's, there's, there's loads there's loads to it, isn't there? There is yeah. one. Now, can I just say something here, which I think needs to be said more often, is he's got an incredibly weird relationship with his dead mum. mm he does. Have you heard the audiobook version where he's talking about how he had a frostbitten willy and his friend said, put this particular balm on it? And he said, well, my mum used to use that balm on her lips. And then in the same breath as him saying, this reminded him of his mum's lips. And the phrasing of this was weird as well. Mm. He spoke about, you know, touching himself. Now, I'm, of course, not accusing Harry of doing anything particularly weird. What I am saying is if I was a psychotherapist, <laughs> yeah. I would of have... Which a, he's seen many, but... Of exactly, which he's yeah. seen many. I would have an absolute field day. And the other thing, which I, <laughs> which I think is quite concerning, is that, you know, I always say, oh, we live in the, like, the post-truth era mm. and so Harry's line now about just being factually incorrect about various different things, uh, yeah. Um, like, for example, where he was when his, when his mm. great-grandma died, is that his memory of the truth, despite being untrue, mm. is the same as the truth. Yeah. And that's mental. Because we can't, like, that's not a thing. We can't live like that. And there was even the experience. Yeah, but, experience. But, but yeah. it's not even that. It's just like, right, well, I remember it this way, so therefore that's true. Yeah, but it, that didn't happen, did it? It's like it's remembering that they landed on Mars, so they mm. didn't. It was the moon, you know? It's not the same thing. And that can't well, help. lived experience. <laughs> yeah. Experience, as it turns out. You, that can't help but, like, colour as well, like, the weird vendetta, like, you... Do, going through it, you do get the sense of if it's not a often slightly tragic in the genuine sense, but also slightly obsessive, constant reference back to his mother and yeah. so on. But like the press features so regular. There's one bit we're talking about taking out Taliban fighters who are on the back of motorbikes, and he ponders for a second about whether or not he did it with a certain focus because of the fact it reminded him of the Paps. Oh. who were often on the back of the motorbike. <laughs> you know, he talks Imagine. about why um, William and Kate turned against Meghan. And he said, I can't remember if it's in the interviews of the book, that, well, they read the tabloids as well. So it's this kind of thing where everything, he's got this kind of theory of yeah. everything, moaning about people quoting his own work verbatim, yeah. and saying that they're <laughs> taking it out of context, which seems to mean they're not republishing the entire book. I don't know what he necessarily means by that. It all exactly. centred around the 25 Gilders thing. And it's just struck that this, he's now become like the premier campaigner against the British press. He explicitly says, I'm here to clean yeah. it up. And he's got all these, he's got about three or four legal cases still ongoing and so on. The kind of hacked off ghouls are sniffing around him a lot. And yet he doesn't even understand the basics of how it works. He doesn't. It seems like. No, I, and I, I do think he's thick. I think he's, that's part It's of been said problem. before, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I do think that's part of the problem, which is that, you know, he's not the brightest at all. And as a result, he thinks that all of this stuff, this intellect that he's now got, this, this lived experience or unlived experience mm-hmm. and pretty basic views on stuff, right, are actually being given to him from on high and yeah. he now has been sent like a like yeah, a woke... he thinks all this Californian babble is profound. It's yeah. profound, exactly that. And most of us look at it and think this is absolute tosh. But Harry goes, this is now, I, it's my duty to feed this through to the plebs beneath me. And behold, you know, as, as, as I pontificate towards it. And, and actually, I, I don't think he's emerging particularly well. He's not emerging particularly well, is he? But the question is now, you know, should he come to the coronation? I... Or actually, a wider question is, if he walked past you in the street, would you actively boo him? Because I think <laughs> I think, I think I would. It's a better question. Yeah. yeah, I think I would just boo him. But it's also, the other thing that's so irritating about it, I don't think uh, people who up to now are on more on Harry and Meghan's team don't really understand how annoying they are. You know, you kind of have this thing, you realise there is a kind of proper cultural yeah. divide. Because yeah, well, yeah. I don't see what your problem is. Like, do you not see 
even on a basic level, how annoying yeah. those people are. Well, that's basically... Like, but there is that sort of thing going on. And it is interesting because on, um, on that sort of... When he's going around making all of these kinds of absurd statements, and it, it's just the fact that it's like all of the naff stuff of our age, the the weird oh. nouveau anti-racism, which is increasingly quite yeah. racist, the psycho babble, the self-help, whatever. He's just like a really crap version of it. And that's why it's so risible, like talking about... Why did you find so much liberation in the army? I turned my pain into my purpose. You know, yeah. he would just regurgitate all <laughs> this stuff. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? But it is, uh, Francis Foster and Trigonometry had a little viral sort of um, satirical clip out about ranting about it. And he said that Harry is what happens when you um, get a girlfriend who's smarter than you and mm. you start taking on all of their opinions unthinkingly. She's not that smart, is she? Well, it's a low, like it's a low bar. It's relative, it's isn't it? Yeah. You, you grade on a curve. The, I mean, I... I <laughs> I try and avoid um, anything to do with this. I've muted the words Prince Harry on Twitter. <laughs> I've had to stop watching GB News for a week or two. <laughs> I obviously am not going to read the book. I try to ignore it. You know, I, 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 I'm not interested in the royal family. I don't want to yeah. abolish the institution. I just personally don't want to read about it because I find everything they do quite boring. But the one person I did used to have a slight fondness for was Prince Harry yeah. Yeah. back in the day because he used to smoke cigarettes and dress up as a Nazi. And it exactly. was relatable. <laughs> <laughs> like the acceptable that's face that's of, the, of the monarchy. For you. I just, just realised I said, I said, I'd like to qualify this, I said the word exactly and then yes, <laughs> immediately before Chris said dress up as a Nazi, right? I already work at GB News. I do not need any more help when it comes to being in the far right. No, but I think, um, I think you're right. But that was the the most endearing thing about Prince Harry was watching him tumble out of nightclubs, yeah. absolutely off yeah. his tits, you know, with angry birds hat on, you know, yeah, off his nut, you know, yeah. someone hanging off his arm. That was the relatable Harry, not this sort of, not this. Yeah. I, I, Peter Hitchens wrote a decent thing actually, was maybe we should be more concerned about his drug use and that potentially. Oh, I thought he yeah. On yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of this element, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, but then, but then this is, this is the thing though, because then it was literally like the third line after Peter just raises a decent point, which is like actually, you know, is basically is Harry all right yeah. just generally, which is fair enough. I think we can all get that, mm. but then it immediately went into. Right, well, what we need to do now <laughs> is execute anyone who smokes cannabis. <laughs> right, all right, Hitchens. <laughs> yeah, he has shown... Prince Harry, this is not Peter Hitchens. Uh, you won't hear a bad word about on this podcast. But, um, who, friend of the show. Friend, friend of the show. show. We should get him on eventually. Um, have a light-hearted chat about Can't cannabis. Say that but, um, well, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but it's he has shown his arse insofar as also he rouses against the press. He constantly talks about press intrusion whilst also intruding on his own family's privacy, hypocrisy abounds, etc. But also how just the sneering at the public has become really explicit as well. So there was another quote in the book which was talking about how Britain is both the, one of the most literate nations yeah. on earth and also the most credulous. Yeah. Um, even in the Oprah interview, everyone forgets this, he started talking about how I didn't used to think Britain was bigoted, but now I... He essentially said, "Now he believes it is because the press have poisoned the well, so they've made everyone." But this, seems, so this seems kind to of be aristocratic disgust. But this seems to be the fundamental. Always the thing. Paradox. If you hate the tabloid press, it's because you don't like tabloid readers, and he's just like the most oh, high status version yeah. of that sort of yeah. thing. I think. Yeah, possibly not so. I mean, as I say, I've not followed this obviously as closely as either of you have, but <laughs> there seems to be a conflict in his basic narrative, which yeah. is that, as I understand it from his Netflix thing. Um, which my wife explained to me, that <laughs> they... I was in that. They think that they... That the British press are racist yeah. and, and yeah. large parts of the British public are racist and that's why they never took to Meghan and why yeah. they had to leave. But at the same time, they say that they were incredibly popular and the press were all over them and William and Kate got really jealous. Yeah. So which is and it? They've moved to America. Were they really popular or were they hated by a yeah. racist press? Well, they, 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 and they've, they've moved to America to escape racism. Mm. Yeah, because well. there isn't any racism. There's no, there's no racism. We're now stamped out in the early days. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of going to America. I just, gosh, want to get away from the gun crime. <laughs> you know, get, away, get away from the gun crime and the obesity. Oh gosh, I'm sick of eating cake for breakfast. You know, just can't can't move for cake. Um, yeah, but no, yeah, I just think I think it, I think they're completely toast, dead in the water when it comes to public mm. popularity. And like yeah. you rightly pointed out as well, even people on the left who've normally kind of fanboyed and fangirled yeah. them are turning away from them now because I think people are just accepting that he is just a simpering ginger idiot. No better point to end yeah. that segment on. But, Chris, we should... From, the, from the gutter press. <laughs> well, yeah. Still having a go at yeah, that. Exactly. Patrick Christie. And the I the wonder gutter press. why they refuse. They refuse. <laughs> <laughs> Simpering ginger idiot. <laughs> Hopefully you make the next series. But um, we'll send them this clip. Chris, let's return to another 
one of our public weeks, health issues. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, public health issues. Public health issue. Which so this is a public health podcast. So this is the news back in November. They've officially changed the name of Monkeypox, which we've covered extensively on the yes. show before, to Mpox. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for reasons to avoid homophobic and racist connotations. They're just racist, I thought. I've seen homophobic banded around. I don't know why, well, just because it sounds funny or something. I don't know if it's just like... Let's explore this. Really. So they've changed it yeah. from Monkeypox and this to is the world. Is this the World Health Organization? This is the problem? World the World Health yeah. Organization. Not a World Health the Organization. The actual yeah. World Health Organization. Ted Ross has been busy working on the rebrand. Yeah. And so, I mean, Monkeypox has pretty much disappeared by November. <laughs> <laughs> just reminded everyone about it by saying we're now calling it Mbox because Monkeypox is racist. What? And he's like, well, what, 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 what? Okay, so let's speak, you know, straight here, if we, if we may. Some very racist people compare black people to monkeys, right? Yeah. Bananas on the pitch in the seventies yeah. and all that stuff. Probably so, doesn't happen very much these days, but maybe there's still pockets of it. I don't know. Bit on the continent. But that's so that's yeah. the, that's the connection between monkeys and racism. Okay, mm-hmm. but. Monkeypox has been around since, I think, about the 50s, mostly, well, entirely until very recently, in Africa, affecting black people. And it was fine to call it monkeypox then. And then this year, last year, suddenly it started affecting predominantly white and predominantly gay Mm. men. And that's the moment the WHO picks to say we need to change the name because it's racist. Well, I mean, it's a weird thing to do anyway, but... (laughs) <laughs> if there was a stigma issue around monkeypox, it was to do with homophobia, as you suggest, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? In that people got the impression, because it was true, that this was overwhelmingly affecting gay men and hardly affecting yeah. any straight men at all. And gay men... Or indeed certain, women. And gay men with certain, you know, appetites. Yeah, yeah, particularly, yeah, particularly um, prolific gay men. Mm. It had nothing to do with racism. <laughs> and the word monkey has got nothing to do with homophobia. Yeah, so yeah. that doesn't add up. Doesn't really make sense. It, it doesn't make any sense. Other than somebody saw the word monkey and started thinking of black people, so we better change the name of that. Yeah, which in I itself is racist. Well, very much so, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, the person who's decided that it's racist is a racist. Because yeah. they can't help but see that word <laughs> they can't, and yeah. think of black people. So they're yeah, racist they're pieces of shit. Turn they should work said, yeah. at the World Health Someone Organization. Someone at the World Health Organization, is that there's an issue with um, with stigmatisation about monkey pops. They need to get Prince Harry like, oh, to I know what you mean. We're great. Yeah. It's about the racism of this. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. No, no. Absolutely not, No, we meant the homophobia bit. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah of not, sorry, yeah, no, no, that's what did I say? Ra- did I say racism? No, no, no. Me and all my mates down at Millwall, we were talking about uh, talking about homophobia as well. <laughs> yeah, no, I am. Um, I mean, I, I just wasn't scared by monkeypox, mm. but for the reason that I didn't necessarily don't, fit the criteria. You don't go to a lot of gay fetish parties. Not since, anymore. Not since the the incident. Yeah. No, I've heard about that. Talk about that. No, um, no I, yeah, I, I think it's just this kind of overbearing desire to not offend anyone, which it actually highlights an issue more than it does. It's a little bit like you know, in com- companies now where they have this really, you know massive unconscious bias training or certain yeah, yeah. quotas to fill and things. Like that. I like my view is you only really need that if you can't help but be racist without it. Yeah, yeah. Why do you need to be told you have to have this mm-hmm. amount of people who are of a particular colour or of a particular demographic? The implication for me there is if there wasn't a rule in place, then you couldn't be trusted to not just employ stale white old men. Yeah. who or, are prob- yeah. or even the training, you know, it's all that sort of stuff. Where it was funny, I think it was during the tail end of the Trump presidency, wake of Black Lives Matter movement, all of these universities, companies, etc., were putting out statements about how they would you know, essentially yeah. repent for the institutional racism in their institution. And the Trump administration, the Department of Education, basically put out, the, oh, we're going to investigate you then. You're saying you're racist. Yeah. We're going to investigate yeah. you. It was like this big troll who made brilliant. a brilliant point. Insofar as, you don't really mean this. <laughs> yeah. but you feel compelled to say it. But, like, I think that's probably a lot of these, um, the unconscious bias stuff, all the other stuff we're talking about. Some of the people peddling it, I think, probably are just dealing with their own actual racism and they're just projecting it onto the rest of the world. There's certain yeah. authors, I wouldn't like to name names, I might get in trouble, but there's certain authors where anti-racist authors who talk about this quite explicitly, that they kind of feel themselves having bad thoughts and that's when sent them down the, you know, the road to righteousness. Before we move on to the post bag, Chris, which we should get to in a second, mm. is um, wokeness an increasing problem in public health? Do you think we remember back during the pandemic, um, public health officials in America saying it was okay to protest for black lives, if, but not to protest yeah. against restrictions and so on? Is this like something you notice more and more that all the social justice wank is sort of creeping in yeah because it's a branch of academia and yeah, what it is <laughs> the I source mean, of all of this the root yeah, of but everything public health academics basically yeah. are, are controlling the narrative and the whole of academia is obsessed with changing the meaning of words and telling people what they can say what they can't say and being very woke and obsessed with you know specific 
you know, personal characteristics. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, you get a lot of it. A lot of it, to be honest, is just exploited, you know, like the whole health inequalities gender, uh, yeah. agenda, um, which is just really a way of getting like the upper middle class to impose their preferences on normal working people and saying, oh, this is how we reduce health inequality. But, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty woke. Um, yeah, no, no more or no less than probably the average mm. university department, I think. But that's how you get ahead of it yeah. these days, isn't it? The new religion as well. They probably pickled in this stuff without even necessarily realising it. But we should, because we're running out of time, get to the postbag section. And all the questions have been emailed in. Postbag, postbag, postbag. Um... It's bulging, eh? We've actually got a question specifically for you, Patrick. Oh, yeah, we sent him. Who would Patrick? This is from Harry and Meghan. <laughs> <laughs> is <that> California. <laughs> even even better is from a bloke on Twitter called C Bass Seymour. Oh, do I know him well? <laughs> it's um, uh, your sock puppet account. No, but um, who would be Patrick's dream three person superstar panel on GB News if money wasn't a factor? Oh my gosh! Okay, gosh, if money wasn't a factor, but mm. like you can have anyone. Dead or alive? Let's do alive, just to oh, make it sort of right, vaguely right. attainable, you know. Well, three stuff. Oh, I hate these questions because uh, it's almost like too big. It's too mm. big a question for me to figure out who I actually really like on. I'd like, I mean, I'd like Trump on, but he's been done, hasn't it, really? That whole Trumpy stuff. It's not very imaginative, is it, really? It'd be very funny, though, so, you know. Well, the thing is, it'd be, in terms of the ratings, it would be great to have. It can be that. It would be great to have Trump on. Mm-hmm. I would like to actually genuinely have Meghan on. Without Harry. In the sort of Benjamin Butterworth role. Of yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You know, the kind of one who's there to get... Yeah, no spin there by it. Yeah. And uh, no censorship. And, uh, you know, I'd have I'd have him on, uh, or her on, even mm. or whatever pronouns they decide no, exactly. they want to do. I feel like I'm being very unimaginative about this. I've got to be honest with you. You're putting the spot. Come on, no, 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 yeah, no, because it's... Well, it's you want people to round against each other, don't you? So if you had Trump yeah. and Meghan on yeah. at the same time, that's a good start. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. You can't really improve on that. You almost wouldn't need a third person, would you? No. No, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd quite like... Who do I think now, really? Come on, hit me with some suggestions. Who would you guys like to have? If you could, you, you know, you are you are almost like... You're punters of GB News to an extent, so who would you really like to have as a, as a panellist, do you think? So maybe we can make it happen. <laughs> I'll tell you who I'd like, Chris Whitty. Chris Whitty? Chris Whitty. Yes. I want to, I've got a lot of questions for Whitty. Also, I like I like the idea of him being in the sort of panel mode, which will involve him talking about some serious questions, but also him talking about there's a seagull yeah. in Scarborough that looks like Elvis. Exactly. Have you seen this, Chris? Yeah. And he'd have to riff on it. Oh, that'd yeah, that'd be, be that amusing, would be good. You know, like the kind of light as well as the heavy I'm quite stories. Like it. Yeah, Chris, you know, thank he you. seems like a natural born performer. Yeah, thank you very much, so, Chris, you know. for giving you a hot take <laughs> on, 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 on the crackers or something. Yeah, yeah well, the, we had that mass explosion at the Gal du Nord, and that was a tragic loss of life, but also the world's first two headed cat born in Delhi. <laughs> thank you very much, Whitty. No, I'd like, I'd like Trump, yeah. Meghan Markle, Whitty. Nice. You can't really improve on that, can no. you? No. I think Witty would be quite uncomfortable in that situation, to be honest with you. It doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, gosh. Oh. So we've got a question here from Paul North. Oh, yeah. Um, for Chris. <clears throat> Good friend this, of mine. This is one for energy analyst and military strategist Chris Snowden. Me. When are we likely to see the government roll out British summertime to the entire year? Well. This should probably um, be explained slightly. This is a sort of... Well, yeah, yeah, of yours. Know, yeah, no, uh, Pete Hitchens is, I forget. Well, well, I don't know what's the recurring really. character in this episode. Yeah, yes, I, I, I am a big fan of British summertime. I would like it to be rolled out year round. But <laughs> I, I tweeted something to this effect last year, and it took on a bit of a life of its own in one or two newspapers. Because <laughs> um, at the time, my Twitter profile said former epidemiologist, mm. now military <sighs> strategist, and energy analyst. Really? The joke being that everyone on Twitter is an expert about something. It used to be COVID, now it's Ukraine and energy. Right? Yeah. Um, but and then I tweeted something saying, hearing rumours that... Now, any anyone who follows me knows that if I start a tweet saying, hearing rumours yeah. that, it will be complete and utter bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, usually me tipping somebody for a knighthood. Um, you posing as this sort of Westminster inside. West, uh, yeah, 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 a yeah. well-connected mm. uh, Westminster inside, yeah. Hearing gossip down, One day down the red line. <laughs> One day you'll tweet something absolutely mental and it'll turn out. And I was like, this guy. I've, I've had one or two quite close shapes. Um so I said, hearing rumours. This is when Liz Truss was uh, prime minister. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, so hearing rumours that in the uh, in the mini budget, Quasi Corteng is going to introduce year round daylight saving time, and w- <laughs> within hours, the the Mail Online had covered this yeah. story with me tweeting, 
saying that um, Christopher Snowden, mm. uh, head of e- lifestyle economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs, former epidemiologist and currently a military strategist and <laughs> energy analyst, which is perfectly plausible, oh, isn't it? somebody who had all, all those interests, no, exactly. um, uh, says that there are Westminster rumours that they're going to have British summertime all year round. And then a few weeks later, the Scottish Sunday Times got in touch mm-hmm. and said, can you write something about British summertime? I said, yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, I said, okay, based on this article. And it was mm-hmm. the time, it was the mail article, which I was the one and only source for this room. And um, so I started writing the article. And then halfway through, he said, actually, we're not going to run the op-ed, but can you just give us a comment on the news story? I said, news story? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Liz Trust is going to introduce British. I said, I don't really know much about that, to be honest with you. But, you know, it's possible that some people in government are interested in doing it, which statistically is quite likely. It's quite mm-hmm. popular, right? And I think they, they, yeah, they did publish a story um, along those lines. And then the actual Sunday Times got in touch a couple of weeks later and said, can you give us a comment about... So this is after Liz had um, been kicked, after the coup. Yeah. After the coup. <laughs> Uh, so no, 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 <laughs> no, no longer in power. And um, Sunday Times said, "Can you give us a comment about you know this this proposal to roll out Britain sometime?" And I said, "Honestly, I don't know anything about it. I mean, so you're trying to back away from I was your own to, fake I news? I thought I got in a bit a bit too deep, yeah. yeah. And they but they still ran it as a, like a page seven story, and it started off saying." If you thought Quasi Quarteng's mini budget was crazy, you should have seen the stuff they left out of it. Oh According to well placed Westminster and so like, No. We're gonna have round the clock. Should we, can we not do something else like that now where you tweet something now, like hearing strong rumours that and it's mad and we see if by the time the next podcast comes around. See if anyone's written See it. if anyone's written about it. Well it's happened before. When I tip Farage for a knighthood, that was that made it into the metro or something like that's that. That's quite a good amazing. one. That's that's a good one actually, because what you've done there, you've hit the the right side of believable, but also mm. quite funny. But think, also get a lot of hate retweets from it. Yeah. I think the close Do you live for the hate sometimes? Well, not hate retweets, just people go, oh my God, I can't believe the yeah. Tory government's going to do this. It's not hate directed at me. No. Yeah. It's directed at, you know, the, the government, which is that, fine. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's what you're all about. <laughs> I think the closest I've ever had a brush with this was I had this viral tweet. During, remember that when that civil servant got sacked because, or he stepped down because he was being bullied by Pretty Patel? Oh. Philip Rutnam. And it, and it was just, Twitter was awash with people saying, this wonderful this man they never met, this wonderful yeah. man's Philip Rutman, like this horrible woman. What so I did this fake, what I thought was an obviously fake tweet about how this is, you know, something along the lines of this is dreadful. I worked with him for 40 years. I said, wow. um, you know, he was wonderful. Like, no, you know, no, no one he worked with didn't like him, nor could any women resist his charm. <laughs> Obviously bullshit. And I got contacted by BBC News asking if I wanted to come on. I got this, that. It got retweeted by Hugh Grant. <laughs> Deborah Meaden. It was went on for days. Deborah days, Meaden. Days. They were like, look at. It was just like I look fourteen as well. So it's like this idea that I was this frazzled civil servant who was very upset about his colleague. It was very very funny. Uh, so, well, this uh, this brilliant. Uh, and is supposed to look for at least two sources, right? Yeah. <laughs> even, even in the gutter press. Yeah. Two so like not standards one, one higher in the gutter press. Obvious troll tweet is, should not really be enough. And then the the the, the, the final chapter in this is after the Sunday <laughs> Times published this. Story, if in so far <laughs> such as it was, Peter Hitchens <laughs> retweeted it. Oh, I'm not saying, saying, looks like Christopher Snowden was onto something with this, and quasi Cotting actually was going to roll out British Summertime all year round. What a weirdo! Thank God he's not in power anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to shoot dope smokers. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I would try and ask another question, but I don't think we can we can top that really. Can so, Patrick, Chris, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> You've been listening to Last Orders. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Please do take a moment to leave us a rating and a review. And if you'd like to support the show, why not become a Spiked supporter? Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to sign up. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters.